In 63 BC, the Roman general Pompey led his legions into the land of Judea. For 100 years, Judea had been an independent nation, and many Jews believed that as the chosen people of the one true God, they would remain free forever. But it soon became clear that the world's greatest empire could not be resisted. The triumph of the Romans produced a crisis of faith among the Jews. For some, the only explanation was that the final battle between good and evil, the end of days, was at hand. They would soon see evidence for their belief. For the years ahead in Judea, it would be one of the most bloody and chaotic periods in human history. This is a story of terrorists and political assassination, of brutal overlords who crucified thousands, and of the siege of Jerusalem with over a hundred thousand people trapped inside. But it is also the story of how, amid the chaos, two new religions began to flower. Religions that would change mankind's ideas about justice, mercy, and God. When Roman troops rushed into Jerusalem, the capital of Judea, they were unaware that they were about to meet the most extraordinary people they had ever tried to conquer. The defenders of the city retreated not to a fortress, but to the temple of their unique God to make their last stand. According to the historian Josephus, when the Romans attacked the temple, their commander, Pompey, was amazed by the behavior of the Jewish priests. Pompey could not but admire that they did not at all intermit their religious services, even when the temple was being attacked on all sides. Nor indeed, even when the temple was actually being taken, did they leave off the divine worship that was appointed by their law. For the temple priests, performing the rituals that honored their god was more important than life itself. For centuries, reports that the Jews believed there was only one God in the universe had fascinated the other peoples of the ancient world. And the Jews' temple in Jerusalem was famous far and wide for the amazing rituals the priests performed to worship their God. The Roman general Pompey was among those who was intrigued by the Jews' unusual religion. He was particularly curious to see what their mysterious God looked like. According to Josephus, as soon as the Roman general gained control of the city, he went inside the temple in search of its most sacred sanctum, the Holy of Holies, where the God of the Jews was reputed to live. There was nothing that affected the nation in all the calamities that they were under, as that their holy place, which had hitherto been seen by none, should be laid open to strangers. For Pompey went whither it was not lawful any to enter but the high priest himself. Instead of the great statue of marble or bronze that he expected, Pompey saw nothing. According to the Jews, their God was so great that he could not be captured by an idol or any other man-made image. He was without form, timeless, and present everywhere. To Romans like Pompey, it was incomprehensible that the Jews would be so dedicated to the worship of a single God. 
Like the rest of the ancient world, the Romans had a huge pantheon of gods, but their most deeply held belief was that might made right. That conviction had won the Romans control of an enormous empire. To them, Judea was only a tiny piece in a great strategic puzzle. They needed to conquer Judea in order to gain easy access to Egypt. But to the Jews, Judea was the promised land given to them by God to be theirs alone. This clash of cultures between the Romans and the Jews would lead to a vicious and bloody conflict that would last 200 years. Even worse for the Jewish people, it was a conflict that would pit Jew against Jew as never before. The Romans come into power and it stimulates an immediate debate among the Jews about whether to revolt against them or not to revolt. And effectively, from the very beginning, there were group, Jewish groups that basically wanted to revolt and others which cautioned and said, well, we really don't need to go so far. So what happens is that these groups are vying with one another constantly in the period of Roman rule. Before long, the fierce disagreements between different groups of Jews over how to deal with the Romans would trigger a Jewish civil war. The physical violence between the different factions grew from the depths of their spiritual conflict. Each group believed that it alone understood the true will of God as revealed in the Bible. And each had nothing but contempt for all who disagreed. The temple high priest and his allies formed the most wealthy and influential of the Jewish groups. The rituals that the priests had been performing for centuries had become so important to their fellow Jews that the temple was the political and economic heart of Jerusalem. Each year, hundreds of thousands of Jewish pilgrims flooded the city's markets to buy sheep, wheat, wine, and oil to bring as offerings to the temple. The pilgrims spent freely, for according to biblical law, offering sacrifices at the temple was the only way Jews were permitted to worship God. Once inside the temple, the pilgrims turned their offerings over to the priests, for they were the only ones allowed to mediate between God and mankind. If you walked into the temple, what you would see is priests who had been um, designated as priests simply because their fathers were priests, only men. You would also see Levites, that is, people whose, parents, whose fathers were Levites who were assisting these priests. There would be animal sacrifices, there would be blood, there would be guts, there would be all of the unpleasant smells of animals being slaughtered. And you would have a real sense of life and death there. For the high priest and his allies, temple rituals like Passover were not only a spiritual outlet, but were the source of great wealth and power. So long as the Romans did not interfere with the temple, they were willing to help the Romans rule Jerusalem. But there were other Jews who believed that the high priest was a traitor. From the day the Romans took over Jerusalem, Jewish rebels began launching raids against them from mountain and desert hideouts. They believed that if they fought bravely enough, God would grant them a miraculous victory, as in the Bible stories of old. To deal with the rebels, the Romans chose a commander known both for his boundless ambition and extreme cruelty, an Arab prince named Herod. <laughs> 
Bird is perhaps one of the most amazing characters in history. What was the guy really? First of all, they debate, was he Jewish, was he not Jewish? And his mother was actually an Arab princess. So he wasn't Jewish. Now Herod had worked under his father in the government because Herod's father was a kind of, I don't know how to call it, almost secretary of state, but it means head of everything. And as a result of this, Herod was involved in what we might call police actions. And of course, eventually he built up enough of a power base that he was able to make himself into king of the Jews. To many Jews, the crowning of a king who was not a descendant of David was blasphemy. And so the rebels decided to come down from the mountains and lead the people of Judea in an all-out revolt. But Herod had Rome behind him, and according to Josephus, he decided to make an example of the rebels. Whole masses were slaughtered in alleys, crowded in their houses, and even taking refuge in the temple. There was no mercy for either young or old, nor were the weakest women spared. Like madmen, they took vengeance on all ages. The last of the rebels fled to caves dug into cliffs, where they were convinced that Herod would not be able to reach them. Herod was really a ruthless guy. He would bring his soldiers to these caves where these rebels were hiding. What he used to do is he would build these kind of scaffolds, lower soldiers down. When the soldiers got down there, they would throw what amount to sort of smoke bombs or smoke grenades into these caves. And when the women and children would come to the edge of the cave, they had hooks. And they would yank these people with the hooks and just throw them to the death. Once he'd tightened his grip on the throne, Herod did the unexpected. Sensing the temple's essential role in the nation's cultural and economic life, he decided to make it into the most impressive monument on earth through a rebuilding project that required mountains of stone and gold. The temple in Jerusalem, first of all, was one of the great wonders of the world. Tourists came to see it. Maybe for our taste it was a little bit glitzy, uh, but it was golden, it shimmered. People thought it was the most, one of the most beautiful places on earth. Gentiles came to bring sacrifices, to offer gifts, because they thought that it was a place with power, that it represented something to them, God's seat on earth. And for the Jewish people, of course, it was quite literally that. It was God enthroned on earth in a place. But no temple beautification plan could make the Jewish rebels accept Herod as king of the Jews. The rebels continued to fight, and Herod continued to kill them. The endless violence was no surprise to another group of Jews who believed that God did not want them to fight the Romans. He wanted them to prepare for the end of days. On the lifeless, heat-scorched shores of the Dead Sea lived a group of Jews called the Essenes. The Essenes had withdrawn from civilization into an apocalyptic landscape that reminded them at every moment that the end was near. To them, that was the only possible explanation for why God had allowed the Romans to conquer Judea. There are here deep echoes from the biblical times reminding them that this had been a land which God had given to Israel and he had purged it of foreigners. And now here were the foreigners ruling once again. So what was to be done about this? This required some drastic new thing. So the notion arose that there must be some final act 
introduced by God himself through his chosen messengers or chosen community that would make things right again. There must be an end of days. There must be a last time when all would be made right. The Essenes followed the cleanliness rituals of the priesthood and rejected both sex and personal possessions. They were determined to live as perfectly as humanly possible until the end came. There are about 4,000 men who live in this way and never marry wives. They teach the immortality of souls and esteem that the rewards of righteousness are to be earnestly striven for. The Essenes spent much of their time making new copies of the books of the Hebrew Bible and other sacred texts so that their eternal wisdom would survive the final battle between good and evil. They were especially drawn to the book of Daniel, which spoke of the reward that the righteous would receive after the end of days. It will be a time of trouble, the like of which has never been since the nation came into being. At that time, your people will be rescued, all who are found inscribed in the book, and those who lead the many to righteousness will be like the stars forever. They believe that everything was preordained by God, and that when the end of days arrived, there would be a 40-year-long war between the forces of good and the forces of evil. They were the forces of good. They called themselves the sons of light. Everybody else, including the other Jews, were the forces of evil, the sons of darkness. And they believed that the outcome of this 40-year-long war was preordained, and that at the end of it, they would be the victors. The Essenes stored their writings in caves they found in the cliffs above the Dead Sea. It was a plan that showed remarkable foresight, for two of their premonitions would come true. A time of trouble more terrible than any the nation had seen was coming. And their Dead Sea Scrolls would survive it. In 4 BC, Jerusalem erupted in celebration. After 40 years on the throne, King Herod was dead. Now, all of those determined to throw off Roman rule saw their chance. More and more armed groups began roaming the countryside, attacking isolated Roman garrisons and looting the caravans of merchants bound for Egypt. But the rebels did most of their fighting, not with the Romans, but with their fellow Jews. For nothing enraged the rebels more than a Jew who had abandoned Jewish traditions for Roman ones. To the rebels, the worst culprits were wealthy Jews who broke the law God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai restricting the enslavement of fellow Jews. The mistreated slaves offered the rebels a perfect opportunity to add to their ranks. And so they began attacking the estate of one wealthy Jew after another, freeing the slaves and inviting them to join the rebellion. They have an unconquerable love of freedom. For them, God is the only Lord and Master. They think it little to submit to torturous forms of death and punishment of their family and friends 
if only they can call no man master. In the eyes of the Romans, these Jewish freedom fighters were brigands and bandits, and that's how they're described in the ancient sources. Uh, in their own eyes and in the eyes of uh, Jewish history, they were not bandits at all. They were like Robin Hood or, if you will, Che Guevara. They were revolutionary figures and uh, heroes of a resistance against a foreign oppressor. But the rebels, too weak to overthrow Rome, only succeeded in plunging Judea into chaos. For decades, the region remained trapped in a vicious cycle of Roman repression, rebel uprisings, and civil war between Jews. You've got Jewish groups, some pro-revolutionary, some anti-revolutionary, fighting within themselves. And you have, at the same time, Roman procurators that are rapacious, taking as much tax money as they can, and in fact, not maintaining law and order. At the same time, you have Roman soldiers all over the place who have no respect for the Jews and for their religion. So the whole thing is sort of careening towards a kind of ultimate explosion. Jesus' conviction that each human being needed to strive to make the world a better place was part of a Jewish tradition that reached back to the prophets of the Hebrew Bible. The more we learn about Judaism in the first century, and especially about the variety of ways of being Jewish in the first century, the more Jewish Jesus looks. The thought that this is a world in which God will reign alone and supreme is supremely Jewish. The telling of parables in order to clarify, make his points, the very form of Jesus' rhetoric is Jewish. Like the Essenes, Jesus was deeply influenced by the prophecies in the Bible that during a period of incredible upheaval, God would redeem the world once and for all. He began to preach that the time had come. He goes around preaching that the kingdom of God is about to begin and everyone must be ready for this kingdom of God. So he clearly is one of those uh, eschatological prophets, those people expecting the end of days that we learn about from the Dead Sea Scrolls, that Josephus tells us about. He's part of this ferment that is uh, that feeds off the expectation that some final act of God must set the world right again. With the countryside in turmoil and talk everywhere of messiahs who would lead the Jewish people to freedom, the Roman authorities were constantly arresting and crucifying those considered troublemakers. In 33 AD, Jesus of Nazareth was one of those singled out and crucified. In the eyes of the Romans, he was just one more would-be Messiah who would not be leading a revolt. But Jesus' followers among the Jews believed that the kingdom of which he was speaking was not of this world, but the next. For the moment, these Jews, who would come to be called Christians, were just another of the many groups of Jews trying to understand the bloody and chaotic world of Judea in the first century AD. According to Josephus, in 52 AD, after years in which rebel attacks on the Romans and their Jewish collaborators were limited to the countryside, everything changed. A new band of rebels arose who were determined to carry the fight to Jerusalem. There sprang up another group, which were called the Sicarii, who murdered men in the daytime and in the heart of the city. To the Sicarii, anyone who wasn't fighting the Romans was a collaborator. 
and worthy of death. They were called the Sakari for the long, thin daggers they used in their attacks. The Sakari's first victim was the most prominent Jew in Jerusalem, the high priest of the temple. Then they embarked on a wave of assassinations, killing wealthy merchants throughout the city. Many were slain every day, and the fear men were in was worse than the calamity itself. For everybody expected death every hour, as men do in war. The willingness of the Sakari and their fellow rebels to use murder to achieve their ends won them a name that would be given forever after to extremists. They were called Zealots. The Zealots were one of several factions of freedom fighters who took up arms against Roman occupation and authority. One faction among them, the so-called Sicarii, literally invented the art of political assassination and terror uh, by adopting the practice of slipping into a crowd, standing next to a Jew who was as assumed to be a collaborator with the Romans, stabbing him secretly, and then raising a cry of alarm. I in the panicked crowd, uh, the assassin would slip away, and the bloody corpse would be left behind as a reminder to any other Jew who was ready to collaborate with Rome that death was the price of collaboration. With the rebels determined to revolt, and other Jews convinced that it would be insane to rebel against Rome, the people of Jerusalem could hardly have been more divided. Then the Roman governor did the only thing that could possibly unite them. He ordered an attack on the temple. In 67 AD, Roman soldiers burst through the gates of Herod's temple bent on plundering it. The governor was eager to steal the vast treasures of God which he held, and his soldiers killed all those they came upon as they forced their way in. Outraged at the attack on the seat of God on earth, rebels and non-rebels alike united to repel the assault. Then, in a fury, they overwhelmed the small Roman garrison stationed in Jerusalem and forced it to flee the city. With Jerusalem suddenly free of Romans, many in the city were seized by a giddy euphoria. The zealots' dream of an independent Judea seemed tantalizingly within their grasp. But others argued that more fighting could only lead to catastrophe. A follower of Hillel named Yohanan ben Zakai was one of the most passionate voices for peace. At the risk of being targeted by the zealots for assassination, Yohanan told his students that it didn't matter who ruled Judea. What mattered was who ruled in their hearts. He argued that what truly pleased the Almighty was not zealotry at all, but something far simpler, the acts of mercy and compassion they showed to those around them. It seems that Yochanan ben Zakkai was part of the peace party. As far as we can see, there were numerous Jews who either because of their own closeness to the Romans, whether business reasons or other reasons, or simply because they were absolutely convinced there was no hope to do such a crazy thing as revolt against Rome, many Jews were really against the revolt. It seems that Yochanan ben Zakkai was one of those types of Jews who felt that what needed to be done was to get some form of accommodation from the Romans that would guarantee Jewish religious freedom and then leave things as they were with Roman rulers. <laughs> But Jerusalem was not yet ready for Yohanan's vision of Judaism. From the steps of the temple, the zealots made a public declaration of war against Rome. 
convinced they were mad, many other Jews decided to take up arms to stop the Zealots. Fighting at this point broke out between those Jews and the rebellious Jews who had uh, taken refuge among them, and it was house to house at some point. Different neighborhoods would belong to one party or the other party, and the streets ran with blood. After a vicious week-long civil war, the Zealots were victorious. They celebrated their victory by setting the city on fire. The Zealots set fire to the high priest's home and the palaces. Then they carried the fire to the place where the records were kept and burned the contracts it held, thereby dissolving all of their debts. This was also done that they might persuade the multitude of the poor who were debtors to join in their insurrection. News of the Zealots' uprising against Rome soon reached the nearby city of Caesarea. Outraged, Romans and Syrians in Caesarea massacred thousands of their Jewish neighbors. In revenge, Jews throughout Judea began killing Syrians and Romans living among them. It was common to see cities filled with bodies, still lying unburied, and those of old men mixed with women and infants, all dead. The whole region was full of inexpressible calamities, while the fear was everywhere that there were even more barbarous times to come. The Romans were determined to crush the rebellion before it inspired others in their far-flung empire to challenge their rule. They dispatched their greatest general, Vespasian, into Judea to lead an army of over 60,000 men. Vespasian marched to the city of Gadara and quickly took it, for he found it destitute of any men fit for war. He then killed all the children. The Romans having no mercy on any age whatever. And this was done out of the hatred they bore the rebels. As news of Vespasian's atrocities swept through Judea, Jews throughout the region began fleeing before his army toward Jerusalem. When the Roman army finally reached the city, Josephus estimated that more than a hundred thousand people were trapped inside its walls. The Romans set up their camps in full view of the city in the hope that the mere sight of their military might would convince the people of Jerusalem to surrender. Their force was composed of three battle-hardened legions drawn from garrisons in Rome, Egypt, and Syria. They were armed with catapults, battering rams, siege engines, the fearsome weapons of war that had helped them conquer the world from England to Persia. But conquering Jerusalem was still a daunting challenge. The city was surrounded by not one, but three walls, which together were nearly 60 feet thick. And in the center of the city, the temple with its own massive walls and towers loomed as one of the most formidable fortresses in the world. But behind those walls, there was chaos. The city of Jerusalem during the revolt was, of course, under complete siege. Food and water were not entering, and inside all the normal governmental institutions had broken down. They were maintaining temple sacrifice, 
But outside of the temple, there were all of these rebel armies. Actually, we know there were about six that were controlling different quarters of the city and whose commanders were fighting over what to do. So you had really anarchy and fear and, as Josephus describes it, tremendous starvation. Inside the city, the catastrophe foretold by Yohanan ben Zakkai was coming to pass. The zealots had begun fighting among themselves for control of Jerusalem. And when one band of zealots broke into the territory of another, they would inflict the worst damage they could think of, burning their rivals' food supply. They set on fire those houses that were full of grain and all the other provisions. And as soon as they were forced into a retreat, the same thing was done to them by the others. Accordingly, it came to pass that almost all the grain in the city was burned, which would have been sufficient to survive a siege of many years. With the food supply decimated, Many decided their only hope was to flee Jerusalem. But the zealots believed God wanted the entire nation to confront the Romans as one. They issued an edict that anyone who tried to leave would be considered a traitor and executed. It's in many ways like the, the militarists within any society in our own time, um, those that, that are um, following a military uh, mode in terms of the Islamic Jihad or in terms of, um, mil of those that we saw in Bosnia. Um, in other words, those that, that, main, that decide that the only way to work is through military means. Um, and that was a scary time for all Jews in Jerusalem at that time because most of them were not zealots. As the siege wore on, the situation inside Jerusalem grew more and more desperate. Of those who perished by famine, the number was great, and the miseries they underwent were unspeakable. For if so much as the shadow of any kind of food did anywhere appear, a war began, and the dearest friends fell to fighting one with another about it. Soon, many people became so desperate that they were willing to risk death at the hands of the zealots. And so, they would creep out little-known doorways and gates to the city and gather weeds to eat. But outside the city walls, they risked capture an incredibly brutal treatment at the hands of the Roman legionnaires. The Nazi Holocaust of the 20th century has seemed to be a, an endless stream of ghastly stories, fiendish stories of, uh, of, of cruelty that seems to defy uh, the human imagination. But there's an, a, an appalling stream of such stories from, from this Holocaust as well. Uh, for example, as people began to attempt to leave the besieged city uh, secretly, uh, when they were captured, uh, mercenaries working for uh, Rome would disembowel them, thinking that they might have swallowed gold or, uh, or jewels and that they were hoping then to you know, recover these uh, after they defecated them later on. This is a, not a strange or unusual practice in the, uh, on the part of people fleeing during time of war. Guessing that this might have happened, they literally eviscerated these people uh, looking for the occasional ruby or, or gold coin. The Romans also took many of the men, women, and children they captured and crucified them. At the time of the siege of Jerusalem, thousands were crucified. The historian Josephus says that the hills around the city were deforested. So many trees were chopped down to make crosses on which to crucify Jews. Josephus also describes what I would call terror crucifixions, 
The city was still under siege, still holding out against the Romans. But crosses were erected on the hillsides around it so that the people inside could see what awaited them if they continued their resistance. Forced to choose between torture at the hands of the Romans or starvation at the hands of the Zealots, the people of Jerusalem were in complete despair. A deep silence and a kind of deadly night seized upon the city. Those that were distressed by the famine were desirous to die, and those already dead were thought happy. It was the last chance for anyone hoping to escape alive. And yet, it was only the decaying bodies of the dead that the zealots would allow to leave. Then, late one night, a procession approached a city gate. It was a group of students carrying the body of Yohanan ben Zakai who had advocated peace instead of war. According to the Jewish book of tradition and law, the Talmud, the zealots were suspicious. Some of the guards asked, who is this? The disciples answered, a dead body. Don't you know that dead bodies may not be kept in Jerusalem overnight? Then one of the zealots decided to drive a dagger through the body. But one of the disciples restrained him by saying, do you want to be remembered as the man who pierced the body of the master? So they opened the gate for the beer and it left the city. The student's trick had worked. Outside the gate, Yohanan sprang up alive from the beer, on which he had been surrounded by rotting meat. Then he hurried away from Jerusalem. Yohanan was convinced the starving rebels could no longer defend the city or the temple. And he had decided that the very survival of Judaism was on his shoulders. After a four-month siege, Rome's legions finally broke through the first wall of the city. The zealots rushed to meet them and fought with tremendous bravery. But they could not prevent the Romans from fighting their way to the heart of the city, the temple. The Romans proceeded as far as the Holy House itself. Then one of them set fire to it. Now the Jews suffered nothing to restrain their force, nor tried to save their lives, since their holy house was perishing. The temple, the only place on earth according to the Bible, where God could be worshipped, was laid to waste by the Romans. As for a great part of the people, they were weak and without arms, and had their throats cut wherever they were caught. In the temple around the altar lay dead bodies heaped one upon another, and at the steps going up to it ran a great quantity of their blood. In the history of the world, no nation has ever suffered such a calamity. The destruction of the temple in the year 70 was the greatest catastrophe and trauma to happen to the Jewish people 
I would argue, until our own time in the Holocaust. It was the center of the economic life of the Jewish people, as if the Federal Reserve was housed in the temple. It was the center of the judicial life. The Supreme Court was housed in the temple. It was the center of the religious life, as if the high priest was the chief rabbi, centered in that building. And in a matter of hours, it was gone. When the temple was destroyed, everything was gone. There was no other branch of government because it was all invested in the priesthood and the high priest and the temple. When the Romans laid waste to the temple, they destroyed far more than a building. The temple had been the economic, political, and religious heart and soul of Judea and of Judaism. The despair that filled the land after its destruction was captured by the poet Baruch. Blessed is he who was not born, or he who, having been born, has died. But as for us who live, woe unto us, because we see the afflictions of Zion and what has befallen Jerusalem. Do thou, O sun, withhold the light of thy rays? And do thou, O moon, extinguish the multitude of thy light? For why should light rise again where the light of Zion is darker? Jews looking at the destroyed temple must have felt terribly, terribly depressed that their entire ability to worship God, to connect with God, had just been so severely compromised. They had been totally defeated by the Romans. Many of them led off into captivity, and this was really a period of tremendous mourning and the need to begin somehow to deal with this terrible destruction. The Romans now had Jerusalem and almost all the rest of Judea under their iron fist. All except for one tiny plot of desert southeast of Jerusalem on the shore of the Dead Sea. At Masada, a fortress built by King Herod atop a butte overlooking the sea, one rebel group was still holding out against Rome. They were the Sicarii, who were named after the long, thin daggers they carried. At the beginning of the rebellion, they had taken the fortress in a surprise attack. Herod had designed Masada so that a small force could hold it against an enormous army. The historian Josephus described the trail that was the only way to reach the top. This trail was called the snake, as resembling that animal in its narrowness and its windings. There is also nothing but destruction in case your feet slip, but on each side there is a deep chasm. Because the snake was so narrow, a handful of Sakari had for years been able to beat back every attack by Rome's legions. But then the Romans began to build a ramp that would enable them to reach the top of Masada. For two years, the Romans built their ramp. And for two years, the Sakari waited. On the day before the ramp was completed, the leader of the Sicarii, Eleazar ben Yair, told his men they faced an awful choice. If they surrendered, the Romans would crucify them as an example to the would-be rebels throughout their empire. Or they could die fighting and leave their wives and children to rape and slavery. 
Then he proposed a third alternative. Josephus learned what took place from two women who managed to slip away from the fortress. To avoid the miseries that were to follow from their enemies, they resolved on the necessity of doing their own execution. Miserable men indeed were they whose distress forced them to slay their own wives and children with their own hands. The husbands tenderly embraced their wives and took their children into their arms and gave the longest parting kisses to them with tears in their eyes. Yet at the same time, they did complete that which they had resolved on. Not able to bear the grief they were under for what they had done, and esteeming it an injury to those they had killed to live even the shortest piece of time after them, they then chose ten men by lot to slay all the rest. And they offered their necks to the stroke of those who executed that melancholy office. And when these ten men had without fear killed them all, they made the same rule for casting lots for themselves. That he whose lot it was should first kill the other nine and after all should kill himself. Now for the Romans, they expected that they should be fought in the morning. But when they made their assault upon the fortress, they saw no enemy, but a terrible solitude on every side. It is here that that tradition of self-imposed martyrdom reaches its most poignant expression. And that is the very eloquent, if heart-rending, statement that when I can no longer choose whether or not to die, I can still choose how to die. And that's what inspired the martyrs at Masada to take their own lives rather than to submit to slavery and death under Rome. In just a few years, most of the groups that had dominated Judea and Judaism for centuries had vanished. The Sakari and their fellow rebels were all dead. The authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes, had also been butchered by the Romans. And with no temple, the priesthood had become meaningless. Just one group remained, the Pharisees. During the 60 years after the fall of the temple, the Romans and their Jewish subjects lived in an uneasy truce. Many Jews moved to the fertile area around the Sea of Galilee to try and rebuild their lives. But there were some for whom the rebuilding only brought on painful memories of the building they longed to reconstruct most, the temple. In 130 AD, anger at the Roman Emperor Hadrian for refusing to allow the rebuilding of the temple reached the boiling point. Rumors of a new revolt began to spread. Many Jews continue to consider Roman presence in the land of Israel to be illegitimate. This was the evil empire it had no business being. Clearly, however, there must have been immediate stimuli to this war, and we're not sure what they were. According to the Roman historian Cassius Dio, it was Hadrian's attempt at building a pagan city in Jerusalem to be called Aelia Capitolina that threw, as it were, the Jews over the edge and into the abyss of military uprising. Another Roman source claims that it was an attempt by Hadrian to prohibit circumcision of Jewish children. We cannot know, but that would have been, at, very mo at the very most, it would have been the final push
into what must have been a popular resentment of Rome that needed some sort of uh, stimulation. The rebellion began among a band of outlaws living in the countryside. Their leader was called Simon Bakocha. The Romans had long considered Bar Kochba merely a thief. But to many of his fellow Jews, he was another in a long line of freedom fighters who had refused to accept Roman rule. Bar Kochba was a Jew like the Zealots, like the defenders of Masada, who was willing to take up arms against Roman occupation and was willing to fight for Jewish sovereignty and, in fact, for a limited period of time, achieved sovereignty. We can hold in our hands the coinage that Bar Kokhba uh, issued in his own kingdom, uh, the last kingdom of Jewish sovereignty for another 2,000 years. Rather than confront the mighty Roman legions from a great city like Jerusalem, as in the last uprising, Bar Kochba came up with a plan for a guerrilla war. A Roman historian described Bar Kochba's preparation for the revolt. They occupied caves in the countryside and strengthened them in order that they might have places of refuge whenever they should be hard pressed. and they pierced subterranean passages from above at intervals to let in air and light. As plans for a rebellion began to leak out, rumors raced through the region that Bar Kochba was the messianic leader foretold in the Bible, who would lead the Jewish people to freedom. His name meant star and he claimed to be a luminary who had come down to them from heaven and was magically enlightening those who were in misery. Simeon Bar Kosiba, as we now know his name to have really been, is called Bar Kokhba, son of a star, because there was a prophecy in the Bible that spoke of a star as a symbolic name for a messianic figure. Now this fellow Bar Kokhba, was a tremendous military leader who between 132 to 5 almost kicked the Romans out of Judea and in fact caused many, many Roman soldiers to be killed in the prolonged battles of the revolt that he had brought into being. But the key point to realize is that the Bar Kokhba revolt was a messianic revolt in which people entered into the revolt believing firmly that the Messiah would come if they would be victorious. Bar Kochba's charismatic leadership appealed to not just peasants and craftsmen, but also scholars and sages. Their fervor was stoked by certain prophecies in the Bible, which they believed said this was the precise moment in history God had chosen for the temple to be rebuilt. Just as the first temple at one point lay in ruins, and was rebuilt, so too were the second temple. And they were, in their minds, God's agents. They were going to defeat the Romans, and the third temple was going to descend from the sky like a prefab, completely built right on that same spot. And that was, in a sense, its messianic mission, that they were doing God's will to throw off the evil empire. That's what God wanted. In 132 AD, the most prominent rabbi in Judea publicly declared that Bar Kokhba was indeed the Messiah. The ranks of the rebels swelled even more. With hundreds of thousands now ready to follow him, Bar Kokhba nevertheless remained patient. <laughs> 
In order to lull Hadrian and his legions into a false sense of security, he counseled his followers to pretend to be happy and peaceful. So long indeed as Hadrian was close by in Egypt, the Jews remained quiet. Except that they made the weapons which the Romans demanded of them as tribute of such poor quality that the Romans rejected them. By this ruse, they were able to have use of these weapons themselves. In a strategic masterstroke, Bar Kochba bided his time until Hadrian was well on his way back to Rome. Then, suddenly, he launched the revolt. In the early days of the rebellion, the rebels inflicted tens of thousands of casualties on the Romans. In the ancient world, Jews were not known as bookish and prayerful and pious. They were known as ruthless and ferocious fighters. They were highly prized as mercenary soldiers. And they showed in the uprising against Rome exactly how effective they were on the field of battle. The stunning success of the rebels forced the Romans to withdraw from the region. Bar Kochba then declared Judea to be an independent kingdom. But the Romans were merely waiting to counterattack until they had assembled one of the greatest armies in their history. They had sent three legions against Jerusalem in the rebellion 60 years earlier. Now they sent 13. Hadrian sent against the Jews his best general, Julius Severus, who was dispatched from Britain. Hadrian ordered him to put to the sword all who stood in their path. Rome responds to Bar Kokhba by throwing masses of its military force into the fray. Legions would be brought in not only from Judea, from Egypt, from the surrounding countries, but as far as across the Danube River. A commander would be brought in from Britain. There was absolutely no way that Hadrian could allow even partial success to this uprising. Severus did not venture to attack his opponents in the open, in view of their numbers and their desperation. Instead, he isolated them in small groups. They dispensed with the rebels who were hiding in their caves by filling them with smoke and guarding the exits. Then they surprised and killed all who came out to fight. 580,000 men were slain in the various raids and battles. And the number of those that perished by famine, disease, and suffocation was past finding out. With the rebellion crushed, the people of Judea faced even worse retribution from the Romans than after the uprising 60 years earlier. For the Romans now set themselves the goal of wiping the Jews from Judea. The Bar Kokhba rebellion was known really as the most disastrous single event that ever happened to the Jewish people before the Holocaust. In fact, when we look at the three literary accounts, we find that they all agree. Nearly 600,000 Jews were killed. Over 900 Jewish villages were destroyed. And for one small moment in Jewish history, again, it looked like Jewish history might have been over. In the aftermath of the uprising, the Romans changed the name of the region from Judea to Palestine. 
Then they banned all Jews from Jerusalem. The emperor then commanded by legal decree that the whole nation of the Jews should be forcibly removed from the district round Jerusalem, so that not even from a distance could they see their ancestral home. Thus the city came to be bereft of the nation of the Jews, and in honor of the emperor Alias Hadrian, the name of the city became Alia. The outcome of the Bar Kokhba revolt is a much more serious policy on the part of the Romans, prohibiting Jews from even going to Jerusalem, and they plow over the Temple Mount and build a temple to their gods on that spot, thereby showing you, you have no place here, we clearly are the winners. In the centuries that followed, whole villages of Jews began to leave Judea in search of a new life. They headed for the Jewish communities that had been flourishing for centuries in Babylon, in Greece, in Rome, and many other places. But in their new homes, they would soon face a challenge to their survival, every bit as daunting as the Romans. There's nothing like a voice from heaven to clarify ambiguity. And in the confusing political situation Constantine finds himself in, um, he and uh, the bishops who are working with him uh, clear up some of the political ambiguity by beginning to talk about voices from heaven or signs from heaven, uh, which at crucial moments in Constantine's political career have indicated uh, who heaven wants to be emperor. For Jews throughout the empire, the new emperor's alliance with Christianity would prove disastrous. The bishops who allied themselves with Constantine were part of the one branch of Christianity that was hostile toward Jews. One edge of Gentile Christian culture itself becomes extremely anti-Jewish. And unfortunately, for later history, that particular edge of Gentile Christianity wins the patronage of the Roman Empire. The anti-Jewish Christian bishops became determined to stamp out the friendship that many Christians felt toward Judaism. Take John Chrysostom, one of the great preachers of the fourth century. He had trouble because people in his congregation thought that the festivals of the Jews were ever so much more interesting than the uh, things that the church put on. And so they would trot off during the high holy days to visit the synagogues. This infuriated John. So he preached a series of eight sermons against the Judaizers, in which he first as far as I know, coined the term the Christ killers in order to, uh, uh, to label those people that he didn't want his congregation associating with. Obviously, this term then is going to have very fateful uh, after effects in the history of uh, Christian anti-Judaism. In the centuries ahead, this new prejudice of Christians toward Jews would lead to anti-Jewish laws, violent attacks, and mass evictions. And so the Jews began to search for new homes in North Africa, in Spain, in Russia. 
king, Nebuchadnezzar. He responded by ordering his troops to lay waste to Jerusalem and destroy the Judeans' most precious possession, the Temple of Solomon. Then Nebuchadnezzar ordered that the king of Judah should watch his sons be put to death as a sign to all that his royal line had come to an end. Afterward, the Babylonians led the people of Jerusalem into exile in Babylon. In 538 BC, the Persians conquered Babylon. Then the Persian king freed all of the Babylonians' captives. One people he encouraged to return home were the Judeans. Cyrus, king of Persia, says this, Yahweh, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build him a temple in Jerusalem, in Judah. Whoever among you belongs to the full tally of his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of Yahweh, God of Israel. But returning to a land their grandparents had left decades before was a daunting challenge. And many Jews who had made successful lives for themselves remained in Babylon. It was the adventurous and the deeply religious who were drawn to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. fourth century BC, a remarkable people invaded the Middle East. They were the Greeks, led by one of the greatest generals in history, Alexander the Great. The Greeks would conquer the world from Greece to India. But there was far more to the Greeks than military prowess. The Greeks had created the most sophisticated civilization the world had ever seen. Their magnificent art was inspired by a reverence for the human body, which also found its expression in the athletic feats on display in their Olympic Games. But the Greeks also revered the mind. And their greatest thinkers were responsible for the flowering of philosophy science, and mathematics. As a result, Hellenic architecture, politics, and economics were centuries ahead of the other peoples of the world. For the Jews, the takeover of most of the known world by the Greeks was a threat more dire than any a mere army could pose. When the Greek world expanded ever eastward, ultimately the Jews of the land of Israel found themselves almost literally smack in the middle of the Hellenistic Empire. The uprising against Antiochus began in the countryside, for the king had ordered his men to travel from village to village with an idol of Zeus. The king's commissioners came to the town of Modein to make them sacrifice. 
Many Israelites gathered around them, but Mattathias and his sons drew apart. The king's commissioners then addressed Mattathias. You are a respected leader, a great man in this town. Be the first to step forward and obey the king's decree. You and your sons shall be honored with gold and silver and many presents. Raising his voice, Mattathias retorted, even if every nation living in the king's dominion obeys him, I, my sons and my brothers will still follow the covenant of our ancestors. As he finished speaking, a Jew came forward in the sight of all to offer sacrifice on the altar. When Mattathias saw this, he was fired with zeal. He killed the king's commissioners and tore down the altar. This conviction that the fate of the Jews depended on defending God's laws at all costs would only grow in the years ahead. And it would set the stage for a true cataclysm when another great empire arrived in the Middle East, the Romans. It's a dangerous position to be in. They are smack in the center. They're the hinge of the three great continents, the known continents of the time, Africa, Europe, Asia. So when the great empires, for example, are coming on a north-south axis from Mesopotamia to Egypt, Egypt to Mesopotamia, guess who's smack in the middle? Israel. And when the axis of empire shifts from northwest, from north-south rather, to east-west, when it's, for example, the, the Macedonian Greeks of Alexander against the, the Persians, who's smack in the middle still? And if it's the Romans against the Parthians, Israel is smack in the middle still. It's a dangerous place to live. So what kind of a theology do people who live in a place like that develop? They're going to be invaded, by the way, no matter what they do. And it's a bad theology to tell them that invasion is a punishment for their sins. No wonder the Bible is filled with people crying out for mercy. They're going to be invaded. If they spend their lives on their knees praying, they'll be invaded. In fact, it's a crime against humanity and divinity to tell them you'll be punished if you sin by invasion. Invasion is their destiny in that position. You can see this most clearly. You can see it all in, in a nutshell in Daniel chapter 7. There's a great vision that Daniel has in that chapter. On the one hand, he sees the great empires, the mighty empires they know, and they're not really like human beings. 
the empires and their imperial rulers, they're like beasts coming out of the chaotic waves of the sea. They're like, they're like a lion, they're like a bear, they're like a leopard. <laughs> that takes care of the Babylonian Empire, the Median Empire, and the Persian Empire. They're not even human. They're chaotic, feral beasts. And when it comes to the Macedonian Empire, the great empire of Alexander the Great, the text stutters in, into... <laughs> All it can say is, they're different. It says it three times. No beast is adequate to it. The, the phalanxes, the mighty phalanxes of Alexander the Great are so frightening with their 20-foot pikes. Imagine a 20-foot pike. You're holding it five feet from the end and five 15 feet are into the killing zone. Five ranks in the killing zone. It's different, is all they can say. So on the one side are all of these great empires. So think of empire. What's the alternative for Daniel 7? The scene is set in heaven. God actually passes judgments on all the empires. They're, they're, they're not even human. Instead of it, there's a mysterious alternative also personified. It's personified in the somewhat chauvinistic language of the original text, like a son of man, which simply means like a human being, like a human being. It's the Semitic way of saying what we sometimes used to say as mankind when we meant humanity. It's not like a beast from the sea. It's like a human being from heaven. It's called the kingdom of God. So over against the kingdoms of earth and their ferocious bestiality, actually, is this truly human kingdom of God. Think of all those images you see. Think of the empires. Think of the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the Persians we talked about, or the mighty empire of Alexander. Empires are not getting nicer, kinder, gentler. They're getting more powerful. So the problem is getting worse. It's, when you look at Alexander, and they thought that was the worst thing they could ever imagine, the, the, the ferocious phalanxes of Alexander with the, with the heavy infantry like the hammer and the, the heavy cavalry, the anvil, backwards and forwards are those 20-foot pikes. And then they got the Romans. It really is not that they are more brutal. It's simply they're much more efficient at what they do with their war and violence. So there's a sort of a, a pressure. When is this eschaton going to happen? When is this kingdom of God going to appear? If not now, why? If not now, when? Empires are getting stronger. Where is this alternative vision coming? So we... Bring in another word, apocalypse, apocalypse, and the adjective apocalyptic. And again, scholarship has sort of mystified an ordinary concept beyond almost all human comprehension. Sometimes you think that's our main job in life, to make things more difficult. Apocalypse is a Greek word, again, that simply means revelation. So apocalyptic eschatology. There's a mouthful for you. Apocalyptic eschatology means in the first century, if I am, let me say, an apocalyptic eschatologist, I have a revelation. I'm claiming and telling you I have a special revelation about the great divine cleanup of the world. That's my claim. So apocalypse could mean any sort of a revelation in itself, but in the pressure cooker of the first century with the Roman Empire taking over the world, as it were, Apocalyptic eschatology meant, I have a revelation about the great divine cleanup. And if you say, well, what's your revelation? It could be anything, on the one hand. But what your audience wanted to know is when. <laughs> the, if you told them, oh, in a thousand years, God's going to clean up the world, you would be an ex-apocalyptic eschatologist by evening. Nobody cared. What they wanted to know, and be convinced by your arguments and by your, your revelation, it's going to happen now. It's going to happen in our lifetime. So, in the first century, the Roman Empire had arrived 
in about, say, the 60s before the time of Jesus. It, it was certainly here to stay. The difference between Alexander's mighty empire was that it swept across the world from the Macedonian plains to the Hindu Kush, and then it kind of came apart when he died. The Romans kept what Rome got. Rome always went in one direction. It seldom, maybe on the fringes here and there, but it seldom went backward. So the Rome, the Roman Empire was here to stay. And where was God? Where was all this beautiful talk about eschatological kingdoms of God and, and a beautiful earth and no, no, no violence, no war, no oppression, no injustice? How could you believe that stuff? So an apocalyptic eschatologist had some way to persuade people that despite all the evidence in a way to the contrary, despite the overweening power of Rome, far greater than Alexander, despite all of that, now, within our own very lifetime, any day now, God was going to clean up the world. And they weren't big on descriptions of how. It was like, it's going to happen, God will overcome someday in our lifetime. And if you said how, it would be like a, a lightning flash of divine intervention. Could we do anything about it? Could we do anything about it? Well, we could pray for it. We could hope for it. We could believe in it. We couldn't really do it. This was going to be God's own divine intervention. God would do it all by God's own self. Just wait for it any day now.